My name is Andreas Jerome, and I'm the Consulting Chief Medical Officer to Quanterix. It's a pleasure that you will are able to join us today, and we'll have two distinguished speakers today presenting in particular on neurofilament assays and their clinical application. One is Henrik Zetterberg from Gothenburg University, and Henrik will go first. And then we'll have Jens, followed by Jens Kuhle from the University of Basel. Each have 20 minutes for presentation, and then we'll open, we'll have 20 minutes for questions. And as you may know, if you've done this in the past, you're able to chat questions into the chat box, and I'll moderate those questions at the end of the presentation and give some other uh, strategic remarks. So with this, Henrik, if you don't mind, we share your desktop. I'll jump right into it. Yes, thank you, Andreas. The title of my presentation is Neurofilament Light as a Blood Biomarker for CNS Disorders. And I would like to start with a background slide where we, we see where um, neurofilament light is expressed in, in the neuron. And uh, the expression levels of neurofilament light is particularly high in uh, large caliber myelinated axons. And this has made neurofilament light traditionally regarded as a biomarker for uh, subcortical and white matter disease of the brain. The presentation I will give now will be on data generated with antibodies by the made by the company Human Diagnostics, and they are all specific to the mid-domain of the neurofilament light molecule. Here, is just some, um, here are just some old data on multiple sclerosis, a typical white matter disease of the brain, where we can see that CSF neurofilament light concentrations are the highest in the active phase of multiple sclerosis. And if you are far from a relapse, the, the biomarkers, the, the, the neurofilament light concentration in cerebrospinal fluid go, go down. This is another slide showing uh, an association of CSF neurofilament light concentrations with um, relapse in multiple sclerosis. And if you treat patients with multiple sclerosis, CSF neurofilament light concentrations normalize. This is a, a, an image we would like to see in neurodegenerative diseases, but we haven't seen, seen it yet most likely because the drugs do not work or the neurodegenerative diseases are more complicated than uh, multiple sclerosis, which, which is, of course, also a very complicated disease. But here the biomarker normalizes in response to successful treatment. Another slide showing basically the same result. If you successfully treat multiple sclerosis, your biomarker will normalize. Your biomarker of uh, axonal degeneration or injury will normalize. Now, we have studied also acute traumatic brain injury to look at the, the, the dynamics of, of uh, neurofilament light concentrations in lumbar CSF. And one group of people we have studied is people who voluntarily expose themselves to, to brain injury or concussion, and that is amateur boxers. So this, this is an old study where we examined 14 amateur boxers and 10 healthy age marched controls. We performed uh, CSF sampling after about and after a rest period of three months uh, where, where the boxers were allowed to uh, perform exercise but not spar or box. Um, the time point, seven to ten days following the, the boxing bout, was chosen on the basis of um, longitudinal studies after stroke. Uh, so the C lumbar CSF concentrations of neurofilament light reach a maximum seven to ten days after a stroke, and that's why we perform the CSF sampling at that time point in this cohort. And here we see a, a, a simple slide on, on the results where you can see that if you look to the right here on the, on the uh, where you see the individual values, you see that the boxers who received many hits to the head or, or received a, a punch to the head which made them groggy, they, they have the highest CSF neurofilament light concentrations. Those who received few hits, they were not that elevated, but actually they were not normal using this variant of the assay if you compare it to controls. We repeated the study in a larger cohort of amateur boxers, and the results were essentially the same with increased concentrations after bout. Here is a, a knocked out boxer. This boxer was knocked out when trying to qualify for the London Olympics. So he didn't make it to the London Olympics, but, but um, he had to rest after this qualification game. And he actually decided to not box again until his biomarkers were normal. So he came 10 days after the knockout punch. Then he came back two months later, uh, and the CSF neurofilament light concentrations remained clearly elevated. And in total, it took him eight months to normalize, which is in the green part of this uh, panel. Uh, th those are the normal CSF uh, concentrations. 
so, so uh, this indicates that there is ongoing release of neurofilament like into the into the brain into the tissue fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid after knockout punch for uh, almost eight months. Traditionally, neurofilament light has not been regarded as an Alzheimer disease biomarker, but again, as I said in the beginning, perhaps more a marker of subcortical axonal like, degeneration of spinal cord injuries and, and, and things like that. But uh, when we examined uh, the ADNI cohort uh, for CSF neurofilament light concentrations, we could see a clear elevation of, um, of the concentrations in Alzheimer's disease. And when grouping the individuals according to um, uh, high, low to medium, medium to high, or, or low concentrations of, of uh, neurofilament light, we can see that those with the highest concentrations are those that progress the fastest in their cognitive deterioration over time, as approximated here by the minimum uh, state examination score. So higher CSF neurofilament light levels predict a more pronounced decrease in, in MMSC scores. And we also saw a longitudinal association with longitudinal change in, in um, MRI uh, data on, on brain atrophy. But if you, if you look across neurodegenerative diseases, this is a study by Tobias Gilbeck in our group, uh, we can see that the Alzheimer's disease concentrations are not that impressive uh, if you compare to other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So the, in this uh, cross dementia disease uh, examination, we, we saw that uh, frontotemporal dementia and vascular dementia are the, the diseases with the highest CSF neurofilamentite concentrations. Uh, AD is statistically higher, but, but not um, as pronounced as, as for VAD or frontotemporal dementia. Across Parkinsonian disorders, we can also see the Parkinson disease patients, patients with pure, pure Parkinson disease, they have normal CSF neurofilament light concentrations, but atypical Parkinsonian disorders are, are clearly increased. And this can actually be used uh, diagnostically. If you'd like, uh, if you're a movement, in a movement disorder clinic, you could actually differentiate PD patients from atypical Parkinsonian disorders rather well using neurofilament light um, as the biomarker, which can be clinically relevant, I, I think, at least in some situations. This has been replicated in other studies as well. Uh, now, um, we have been interested in, in trying to develop peripheral blood biomarkers for CNS disorders, and neurofilament light has been our top candidate. And uh, what we decided to do was to transfer the human diagnostics ELISA onto the single molecule array platform. And um, uh, SIMOA is a technique where you, you, it's uh, based on, on um, well, the basic sandwich assay, but the capturing antibodies is conjugated to magnetic beads. So you have beads with antibodies, and then you have your, your sample with the molecule of interest, and then the detection antibody forming a sandwich. And this detection antibody has, uh, is labeled with beta-galactosidase in this uh, SIMOA setup. Uh, the trick in this assay is that you pull, instead of um, uh, having the, the detection reaction going on in a solution, you pull down the magnetic beads into microwells, where one bead will fit into one microwell that holds only 50 femtoliter volume. And then after you have added the substrate of beta-galactosidase, you seal the microwells with an oil film, and you allow the detection reaction to go on. And then you, you look at shining versus light emitting versus black microwells. And if you have diluted your sample so that most wells are uh, negative or black, you can actually count molecules. So this is sort of a single molecule counting um, uh, reaction, which, which makes the assay much more uh, sensitive than, than um, the regular ELISA. And by transferring the human diagnostics ELISA onto the SIMOA platform using a homebrew kit provided by Quanterix, uh, we could rather easily gain in analytical sensitivity. Uh, and by doing this, we could actually see uh, CSF neurofilament light concentrations that, that um, in, in uh, or seromorplasma neurofilament light concentrations uh, in all uh, plasma samples we examined, also from healthy individuals. Um, so this allowed us to start examining uh, seromorplasma neurofilament light concentrations across different CNS disorders. And I will show you some data on this. Uh, here are some precision, precision data. This, this assay has a reasonable um, analytical variation. We could also define a low limit of quantification of 0.62 picogram per milliliter. We dilute the sample, we get a reasonable parallelism. 
sample stability, if you freeze those samples, not, not much happens actually. Here we did a direct method comparison together with Jens Kuhl, who will also speak later in this session. So we compared, the, the, this is um, ELISA with the, uh, the human diagnostics antibodies, the human diagnostics ELISA, and they were the same antibodies transferred, uh, the same assays what were transferred onto to the mesoscale discovery platform, and then to the right you see the SIMOA results. And in the A panel, you see that ELISA on the x-axis has, a, you, you see clearly that, that low concentrations in serum will not be measurable with ELISA. It's a bit better with mesoscale discovery, uh, mesoscale discovery assay variant, but with SIMOA, we get measurable concentrations in all samples. And we see nice correlation between CCF and serum uh, concentrations. And the different methods correlate in CSF, but not in, in uh, for obvious reasons, not in, in serum. This is the first pilot study where we examined severe traumatic brain injury patients. And on the x-axis, you see the different sampling time points. So acute samples, and then one day, two day, three day, and, and so on, sampling time points. And you see that, that uh, serum neuroflame and light concentrations steadily increase over time. And we can also see that, that um, it's not in this panel, but that those with the highest serum concentrations were the ones with the worst uh, outcome. Uh, those who survived until the one year follow-up time point were a bit more normal, of course, but not entirely normal uh, if you compare to normal control individuals in green to the right. We see this nice correlation between CSF neurofilament light concentrations and plasma neurofilament light concentrations. And this is to my knowledge, the first correlation like this for an established CSF biomarkers to be, to be seen also in a blood sample, which was uh, de delightful to see. And now we actually have data on, on uh, four or five independent materials in this. This is plasma neurofilament light concentrations in HIV-associated neurocognitive dysfunction. In the C panel, you see CSF neurofilament light concentrations, and it's been well known for quite a while that individuals who have HIV-associated neurocognitive dysfunction or even HIV-associated dementia, they are the ones with the highest neurofilament light concentrations. And this is replicated in plasma uh, in the B panel. We have also examined serum neurofilament light concentrations in frontotemporal dementia subtypes. As you remember, the CSF, we're looking across dementia disorders. Frontotemporal dementia is really the, the disease that stands out in regards to, to CSF neurofilament light concentrations. And uh, this is replicated also in, in serum. So you see clear elevations in most frontotemporal dementia disorders. Um, in the, one of the worst neurodegenerative conditions one could imagine, in quite take of disease, we see also very clear elevations. So to the upper left, you see serum neurofilament light concentration in, in sporadic and genetic quite take of disease with very High, uh, strong elevations of, of uh, neurofilament light in cortical take-off disease as compared to controls and also dementia uh, controls in this case. The similar uh, changes are seen in CSF, which has been known for a while. You can hear much more about multiple sclerosis from Jens Kuhler, but this is also just one study we just conducted on, on treatment of multiple sclerosis with a disease modifying treatment. And we see that most patients normalize over 12 to 24 months in regards to the serum neurofilament light concentrations uh, in response to treatment. Here's a study we did together with UMIO researchers up in northern Sweden where uh, they performed an experimental study where they injected an intraventricular catheter into, uh, to um, administer a, a potential medication against multiple sclerosis, progressive multiple sclerosis. You can see that this insertion of the catheter uh, results in a sharp increase in neurofilament light concentration. So this is, uh, also indicates that this is a sensitive marker for, in this case, me mechanical neuro, uh, axonal injury. And here we have results from the amateur boxers. Uh, this is the same cohort uh, on the bo same boxing cohort that I showed data on uh, in the beginning of this presentation, CSF data. And here you see that the CSF data are replicated very well in, in the plasma neurofilament light. So those who took many hits to the head have clearly increased concentrations in the A panel here uh, as compared to those with few hits to the head. And both groups are increased as compared to age and gender matched controls. In the B panel, you see the, the rest the uh, resting samples after the sun rest. And actually the boxers are not entirely normal even though they haven't boxed for three months, which is uh, um, probably, um, uh, well, it is, to some extent it indicates that it's probably not that healthy for the brain to, to, to be a boxer. 
So, uh, CIMO allows for the reliable measurement of neurofilament light in blood. Plasma neurofilament light concentration correlates with CSF neurofilament light and is increased in acute TBI, as well as in several neurodegenerative and neuroinflammatory conditions. Uh, this study was done together with human diagnostics, of course, and here's a, a picture of the people in the lab in, in uh, Gothenburg, Mendel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Henrik. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I would uh, mainly like to present two studies in this webinar. One of the studies is the one that Henrik already alluded a bit on. This was, uh, I think, a really interesting study to, to show directly the comparison between three relatively known or some of them relatively known assays. One was the ELISA assay by uh, Uman Diagnostics and uh, on the other hand the ECL, so the MSD assay for this, using the same antibodies as the ELISA and then SIMOA platform uh, that, we, that we were collaborating with Henrik on and these samples were measured in, in Gothenburg on the SIMOA platform uh, for serum NFL. And uh, I mean, this is where, where our group was mainly coming from. So we had established an, an assay for NFL in, in serum and plasma samples using these two monoclonal antibodies. And this was published in 2013, where we already saw this, also mentioned by Henrik, these very nice correlations between CSF and serum NFL measurements. And uh, looking at serum NFL, we saw clearly increased levels in, in different uh, neurodegenerative, also inflammatory neuropathies, less clear in Alzheimer's. But we, very interesting and important finding was to see these correlations here and also parallelism between serum and, uh, and calibrators. And uh, so this assay we used extensively to publish in different fields. When we looked in MS in 2016, we did see that the sensitivity of the MSD assay was not completely sufficient to quantify NFL in plasma serum samples of, of multiple sclerosis. So uh, this was already also an important uh, starting point to, to switch towards the SIMOA technology. And for this study, uh, to directly compare these different methods, we uh, selected pairs of CSF and serum samples based on what we had measured before. So we chose high serum and CSF samples, medium and low samples, and also some unmeasured pairs of MS. And when we looked at sensitivities of these different platforms for this assay based on uh, acceptance criteria for Calibrators we already saw and what was already known by Henrik's group actually that the SIMOA assay is indeed significantly more sensitive than ELISA or ECL. And interestingly also we saw several very high NFL concentrations in the ELISA when measuring uh, serum samples and these were also in the, so in the supposed to be low samples or medium samples and these for example five samples were below sensitivity when measured by ECL or uh, with Simoa pointing to the problem of, of potentially uh, heterophilic antibody uh, leading to maybe not correct measurements. And as Henrik already showed, so we compared CSF and serum levels with ELISA, ECL assay, and the Simoa methodology. And I think it's clearly see visible that uh, for Simoa, there's a relatively nice correlation between, I mean, a very nice correlation between CSF and serum. And we do have these uh, sensitivity issues with uh, the ELISA, but also the ECL assay uh, leading to the inability to quantify uh, significant numbers of samples. Looking at CSF, it's always nice uh, to reproduce also what everyone would expect. But we've had these stories in, in the biomarker field before, especially in MS, that it's not easy to reproduce also things that one would expect. And uh, this is very nice to see that if we use CSF and if we use the different platforms, we see a very tight correlation between the different assays in CSF. And looking at correlations uh, in, in serum measurements between ELISA, MSD, we do see some sort of an association, but we have the sensitivity issues. Looking at CIMOA, we see that all samples were, we were able to quantify all samples which was not the case for the ECL assay leading to the best correlation between 
these different platforms. So we with this with this experiment we we saw that the Simoa platform was 126 and 25 fold more sensitive than ELISA or ECL assay respectively. As I mentioned, we were able to measure all serum samples. We saw matrix effects uh, for the ELISA and uh, very nice correlations for CSF and uh, good correlations also, especially between ECL and CMOA technology. And uh, we confirm that serum NFL can be reproducibly measured in different platforms. And uh, I would like to thank especially our collaborators in Gothenburg, Henrik Zetterberg, that, who has been a great help in also helping us to build up this essay in Basel, and uh, all others in Basel, and also the sponsors. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jens. Why don't we now continue with some of the questions or the questions which came into the chat room. And before we do so, again, I want to thank Henrik and, and Jens for presenting uh, very <laughs> exciting new data here. One of the things I wanted to point out as this has come up as a question, these assays were originally developed as what we call the homebrew program through Quanterix. These <laughs> assays will now be made available as commercial cats at the end of uh, November 2016, early December. Quanterix also has what we call accelerator lab services to be able to analyze samples, clinical, preclinical samples for not just neurofilament light chain, but other, also other biomarkers as part of the assay menu or through in-house developed assays as well. So we can come back to this and address this in more detail. So then a couple of questions which I think has, have come up here with regard to the relative concentrations of NFL in plasma versus serum is this influenced by platelets. So in your ex analytical experience, Henrik and Jens, are the values in, first of all, have you done any analysis and matched plasma and serum samples, and if so, do we know if one matrix is preferred over the other, so we can qualify what preferred means? I don't know what uh, should, should I, I could start to mention that we have done, we have done a formal um, uh, comparison. It's a bit limited still, so uh, as always, I think more research is, is needed. So please, when you collect samples, collect both serum and, and plasma. So for neurofilament light, it looks like uh, serum and plasma levels are comparable but that serum levels are a bit higher, and we do not know why, but it's, it's, uh, it's really on the limit of, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a big difference. So I, uh, I would almost say that they are comparable, but statistically slightly higher, uh, perhaps 1.2 times higher or something like that, but uh, more research is needed. Uh, in the same experiment, we actually compared the tau between plasma and serum, and there we have a more clear result that uh, Plasma concentrations of tau are higher than serum. Uh, again, we do not know the reason, and more research is needed. Um, in regards to the question on release of neurofilament light from blood platelets, I think that is not a big issue for neurofilament light, because as far as I am aware, there is not much expression of neurofilament light in blood platelets. But I am not 100% mm -hmm. certain on that. Jens, would you comment no, on that? I, I fully agree. I mean, we, we made independently, we made the same observation that plasma levels are approximately 10, 20 percent lower than serum levels, but they are extremely highly correlated, serum and plasma, but they are, plasma levels are slightly lower in our experience, which is actually yes, based on 50 to 100 paired samples. And um, yeah, for regarding platelets, I, I agree with what Hendrik thinks about the release from platelets. Okay. And then I guess a related question to this from a technical perspective, in order, I think it was on your dilutional linearity slide, in order to see dilutional linearity now, what is the dilution of either plasma or serum sample in, on, for the Samoa assay? Yeah, we, we, we use a four-fold dilution uh, uh, just as, as the dilution that most often gives uh, values within the, the the, the the range of the assay. Uh, or no, do you what do you do? We yes, also, we, we we all yeah, use yeah. for CSF we use one in ten, and for plasma yeah. and serum we use one in four. Okay. But one can dilute more, uh, and especially if you have samples with higher concentrations. And, and those yeah. of you who work with um, rodent samples, you you might want to dilute more to save. Uh, sample volumes. Uh, so neurofilament light is 100% conserved in, in 
rodents and there you can actually dilute your sampling more because the concentrations are a bit higher also. It wasn't necessarily a question, but while we're on the topic of cerebral spinal fluid now, because of this being an ultra-sensitive assay, the most sensitive NFL assay, soon to be commercially available as a commercial kit, what is the dilution in CSF in preclinical animal samples and clinical samples? I mean, for for mice we used, uh, for CSF we used 1 in 14, okay. and uh, for plasma we used 1 in 4. In, in human CSF, is this the same dilution? Human CSF, we use one in ten. Okay. And uh, Henrik, this matched in what you do in, in yeah. Gothenburg as well? Uh, that's similar, but um, most often we do not use the SIMO assay for, for CSF since uh, we have sort of um, felt like uh, the analytical sensitivity is not really needed, so, so we do not occupy the instrument with with CSF samples, human CSF samples, but for rodent, of course, uh, one would really like to, to save the volumes since uh, at least mice do not have that much CSF. Yeah. And then I just for, for people who haven't worked with the Samoa platform yet, the volume plasma diluted fourfold into the assay is 25 microliters for single analysis. Isn't that correct? Yes, yes. For the mice, the CSF, we used five microliter uh, volume pure CSF. Okay. Um, one of, I mean, maybe related to as we're getting into stability, I mean, there's a question of stability of archived samples. I mean, do we, how far out in terms of months, years, have you analyzed samples? I know maybe more anecdotally than being done in a rigorous fashion as of, as of today. Do we have uh, any we data have a, if there's a critical uh, yeah. inflection point after five years, stability frozen at minus 80, these samples are not useful anymore? Mm. We have no such data in-house, but we have done freeze-towing at least, and there it appears really stable. So uh, freeze-towing is not much of an issue for neurofilament light at least. Okay. And, and for Jens, I don't know if you had any archived older samples you've analyzed in the Yeah, we, I mean, we've... we've We've had some re very, I think, very useful data in samples as old as 20 to 30 years regarding yes. serum samples. I do not know what would happen if these were not 20 to 30 years old. And I think it's very important that, you, that your comparator groups are at least at the same age storage time, but there seem to be some reasonable correlations with, with clinical variables or paraclinical variables in such old samples. Of course, I do not have um, I do not have formal data except yeah. that we also did free storing up to five times and and room temperature up to eight days where we didn't see a relevant effect. Okay, then related. I to could this, also uh, add there actually that you know that the boxing data I showed uh, on one of my last slides were on samples collected in 2006 and the nice correlation mm -hmm. with CSF that was maintained. So so yeah. it also it also adds to that this is probably. Mm -hmm. Rather stable, I would say. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, just on the when we finish up on the analytical aspect, so the precision the precision data you presented, the lower limit of quantification was based on a 20% precision cutoff. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So typically, yeah. at the lower end of the curve, I mean, towards the LOQ, the lower limit of quantification, what what percentage CVs do you see? I think it was 13 or less than 10% on one of the slides, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it's around 10. Yeah, okay. And this is, so for Henrik, I mean, for Jens now, is this the same experience now as you've independently validated yes. the assay in, in Basel? Yes, this is very much our experience, actually, that we, we do get nice CVs also in the very low range of, of concentrations. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, again, we're coming into the bucket of biological questions here as well to a certain degree. Um, on the first slide, I think, or the second slide after the intro slide, there's obviously various, I call them flavors or forms of neurofilament. There's the heavy chain, which is, appears to be phosphorylated mostly in fluids, and there's the light chain. There's also the medium chain. So one of the questions shedded or articulated here was, is, is neurofilament light chain phosphorylated? And I think we know the answer, but maybe we should talk about this and what do we know about comparison to the to the phosphorylated heavy chain i could just mention it's, it's not phosphorylated and it's um, it, our experience is a bit limited but we, when we have done uh, both uh, 
NSH phosphorylated with our commercial assay, so that and compared with uh, the, the human diagnostic CSF neurofilament mm. assay, uh, they correlate. But um, uh, we haven't done much. We, we have sort of uh, almost we are focused on neurofilament light as the marker, and not done much more on the other variants of neurofilament okay. neurofilaments. Relatively similar with us. And I think it uh, needs to be really confirmed if heavy chain versus light chain has a different meaning in, in MS, which it was postulated that heavy chain could represent more chronic damage and light chain more acute damage, but this needs to be followed up. Okay. I mean, so I guess based on some of limited data in the literature, if I may chime in here for a second, it appears in that there is, I mean, in CSF, there are complexes of light and heavy chain. I don't think we've seen data for, moon, for medium chain. It's a little bit unclear what the stoichiometry of, of the phosphorylated heavy to the light chain is, at least in CSF. I don't think it has been explored in, in, in plasma or serum EDTA plasma for sensitivity reasons. Isn't, isn't that what some of the literature suggests? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I think that's not really clear at the moment. Okay. Um, there's very little medium chain data in CSF around, but nothing on, on in serum or plasma. Okay. And then another question. So you showed correlation, and you mentioned that this has been done in a number of independent studies between CSF and plasma or serum, and there is correlation between plasma or serum with lower values in plasma, ETA plasma. Where do we think, I mean, the NFL, is this a is this brain or peripheral nervous system specific neurofilament light chain we see in the periphery, or is this based on blood-brain barrier disruption as it may occur or does occur in traumatic brain injury, particularly severe, but the lymphatic system, um, or do we, see, do we think there are other sources for a peripheral NFL? Or NFL yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, yeah, there is a neurofilament, uh, all neurofilaments are expressed also in almost all, in the peripheral nerves. So yeah. neurofilament light is expressed also in peripheral nerve, but I still feel a bit um, reassured uh, when looking at the correlation between CSF and, and plasma or serum neurofilament light. So I think most of the neurofilament light uh, in uh, plasma is, is brain derived. But uh, when we talk about traumatic brain injury and there is, uh, uh, in cases where there is trauma also to other parts of the body, then perhaps one could, that could, this could be a confounder that we need to address. Um, and really be careful uh, about uh, if there is peripheral nerve injury. Um, but yeah, uh, at least to me the correlation indicates that, that uh, there is a, a rather clear relationship. Okay, and then I guess related to this, I mean, the, what, is, what do we know about clearance? I mean, this question comes up not just for NFL, but for other biomarkers in the periphery. I mean, do we have any data in terms of how this is removed from plasma or serum once it's been, once we find it in plasma or serum, or this is research to be done? Hmm. I think there's um, no data, right? I'm not aware of any data that could be helpful here. Mm. Well, I'm uh, thinking about the uh, traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury studies again, where you have one trauma and then you have sequential samples from the individuals. But th th this is, of course, not, uh, complicated because you have also Valerian degeneration and a continuous release of neurofilament yeah. light from, from injured yeah. axons, also in, distally from, from, um, from, from the, uh, the dissection of the, the dissection point of the axon. So um, we do not know if the prolonged uh, increase of CSF neurofilament light following acute condition, if that represents um, a, a, a very uh, slow uh, clearance yeah. of the protein or if it's a continuous release. And I think it's the same in the blood. For tau, there is a, and this is another <laughs> issue. So, so to me, it looks like neurofilament light is rather stable in blood, but of course it has to be clear somehow. Um, mm -hmm. For tau, it looks like if you have an acute injury, then you have a rapid increase in plasma tau levels, but also a rapid decrease. So the, for tau, I actually think there is active degradation of the molecule in the, in the, in the blood. Mm -hmm. But I have no, the, the, there is not much more evidence than, than this observation I just mentioned. So I think there is a lot of, um, here we need to do more research, as Jens also said. Okay. And I guess, as you brought up the, the tau, the total tau of relationship, let's call it this way, 
Are there in any studies, studies you have done were in blood or in CSF, you have looked at the correlation of norofilament light chain to tau, supposedly both markers of axonal injury, maybe smaller diameter and larger diameters, but what do we know about the, the release in the correlative release and of a new measurement of these biomarkers in across nor or in neurodegenerative diseases, including on neuroinflammatory mm -hmm. like MS? Exactly. I do not know. Well, we should have some data to examine this, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. I mean, in MS, we looked in a, in a relatively limited set of data, and there we didn't see correlations between tau and NFL in MS. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, tau in multiple sclerosis has been, I don't know, disappointing. Is this a wrong word? Yes. No, I shouldn't use it, but it has not lived up to its reputation, I guess. Maybe because yes. of the fact that there's a specific form of tau in CSF. I mean, total tau is is kind mm -hmm. of a bucket for for everything, which may may be distinct across neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, tau is also not elevated in FTD compared to controls, yeah. unlike Alzheimer's disease, for example. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So then, I guess related to this, from a clinical perspective. Do we know why um, Henrik showed the slide controls MCI and AD and also uh, across, across variants of FTD? Why we see these elevations of, of NFL in FTD when compared to other neurodegenerative diseases and why in, in AD compared to MCI and cognitively normals? Is there any speculation why, why we see these elevations in either CSF or blood? I think the data you showed were blood for blood and then earlier data in CSF. Yeah, yeah, I think there is a lot of neurofilament light in the frontal lobes. <laughs> uh, and then there is also this, uh, you know, if FTD, if you also have comorbidity in motor neuron disease and FTD, then, then definitely you will have, I mean, uh, I think we showed, all, yes, Jens showed the slide with some ALS patients, because those are also very uh, increased in, in CSF and serum uh, neurofilament light concentrations yeah. because of the spinal release from spinal cord. Yeah, I agree. I think the spinal cord comes into play here in ALS also, um, mm. which I'm yeah I do I I'm also puzzled by the FTD why exactly in FTD, but that's uh, for me it's not exactly clear because they don't have a spinal or cerebellar involvement really, right? So, yeah. Well, the FTD with the motor neuron disease phenotype, I mean, they may, yeah. they, yes, they do, because they're, I don't know if they're more yeah. ALS than their FTD, but in, the, agree, yeah. in, the, mm. in some of the behavioral variants, yeah. there's the high, there are high concentrations of yeah. NFL and plasma as well in FTD. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I remember the Rohr et al., this Hendricks paper as well. Um, mm. So a question with regard to, I guess, clinical management or clinical diagnostic in TBI, so in particular in mild TBI, the data you showed for severe TBI that suggested there's more a prognostic management role than there is a diagnostic role. I mean, to diagnose severe TBI, there's really no need for a biomarker, in, in my view. So do you, both of you, it could be a question for both of you, is NFL ready for management of mild TBI slash concussion, maybe eight in diagnosis in comparison to Glasgow Coma Scale or to... Um, Basically, it, I mean, not admit people with with mild TBI, but keep those with the see what we call moderate forms, so CT positive forms of, of mild traumatic brain of traumatic brain injury. I, I think that the data speaks uh, speak for that use, but we have to do some more studies, and especially in regards to time of sampling, and um, so we have to do more studies uh, following mild TBI concussion and have repeated samples to test following the. The injury and also look carefully at the, the um, potential uh, confounder from peripheral nerve re release. But uh, I think that would be um, minor issues. If neurofilament light follows the same kinetics as CSF, it might be that it's a bit, uh, it might be a bit later as a marker than uh, perhaps mm -hmm. it's not a one hour sample that would be useful, but perhaps it's, it will still be like, it will instead be like this that you. If you, you um, participate in a sports activity, you hit the head and you uh, stop playing, and then the day after you do not feel that well, and then you're a bit worried about this, that you perhaps will come to, and have your plasma or serum neurofilament light concentration analyzed day two or three or four or something like that, and then you could use it. it might, there was also data indicating that plasma tau works earlier, so perhaps one can 
have this combined test, uh, plasma tau as an earlier marker and urofilmatite as a bit of a later marker. But that's, this is mostly speculation, of course. We have to do those studies. So, I mean, but you did, you and Kai and, and co uh, contributors um, did publish a paper earlier in the year where you followed and measured NFL over the course of a season in American football players. Isn't that how I recall that paper? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And that is, uh, that was, that we didn't have concussion data, but we saw a clear difference between, now I'm not an expert in American football, but between starters and non-starters. And apparently those who know American football well say that starters have a lot of more a lot more head impacts, but they also have impacts to other parts of the body. So, but they increased in, uh, in serum neurofilament light concentrations over the course of the season, whereas non-starters did not. And we are about to complete a study on concussion, uh, real concussion events in, in American football. Okay. So in particular in AD, MCI, and cognitively normal, I'm not sure if the, you mentioned this five independent studies. Do we see a correlation between... CSF and plasma or serum in, in Alzheimer's disease and, and associated disease states, if we call it this way? And is this, are there differences for, let's say, I mean, I don't know if we want to go as far as preclinical AD, but let's say cognitively normal MCI and AD, is this, is this, is this correlation the same across these different disease states? I think so, but we do not have the data yet on, on, on this, but uh, there will soon be such data. Okay. So this is work in progress, basically, for towards yeah, the end yeah. of the year. Um, then the technical question, the capture and detection antibodies, the Oman antibodies now employed in the Samora assay, um, are they both recognizing the mid-region of NFL or are they, are they in the, in the mid and the C-terminal region? I think both are, I think it's to the, that both are to the mid part, but I do not know the epitopes. And then a question with regard, and I'll take this with regard to the analyzer. So the Samoa analyzer, we call this the high definition one analyzer. Uh, Jens showed us on one of the slides, is designed as a standalone instrument for clinical chemistry applications. So the uh, concept is uh, samples in and results out basically, and we have a picture there. So it's a, maybe on the next slide, yeah, there we go. So if we had a uh, person standing in front of this, it's like a cabinet. It's a, it's a reader on top of the bench with buffers and others below below the bench that's that's the side but this is a standalone unit basically where samples are uh, provided and then four hours later the results are available another question with regard to the menu now nfl with the release of a commercial kit and the availability of sample analysis and the accelerators there is a strategic focus at quanterics on the cns biomarker menu which includes our Total tau assay, there are assays for phosphorylated tau and other synaptic markers being released by Quanterix, a strong focus on neuroinflammatory <coughs> markers which have been addressed and compared by independently by uh, actually a biotech company. That's a paper which was published earlier in the year across platforms. There are assays which will be made available, uh, commercially available as kits for alpha synuclein and PTMs of, of alpha synuclein as well. So it's a rich menu. There's interest in follow-up. Um, we're obviously more than happy to provide that information. I mean, maybe so, we, I can also mention our strategic orientation in Basel. We are very happy to look into well-defined cohorts focusing on multiple sclerosis or similar diseases. So I'm happy to uh, collaborate and talk to people about these potential collections. Okay. So maybe a last question, and I know Kevin has joined us, so Kevin will, will uh, close with a few remarks here. Maybe the last question then, um, if there are no other additional urgent questions, is what, is what do we expect in terms of the uh, correlation between NFL and NFH? So I think this refers to phosphorylated norfilament heavy chain in CSF, and as we said before, there's these data, there's some data which exist in the ALS community in the ALS space, but for other areas, they really have to be developed, and they have been limited really by analytical sensitivity of the assay. Isn't that a, a fair statement? I agree. I mean, this is, uh, there were some initial hints that in, in progressive disease, this correlation would be less clear, but I really think this is mainly driven by assay performances also, and there's nothing for serum and plasma with this regard. Okay. And Henrik, I don't know, a final, final comment or? No final comment. 
Well, good. So let me let me thank you both before I thank all participants and don't don't hang up yet. We have Kevin Rosowski who joined us now, and Kevin will will close out this webinar with a few comments. So Kevin, if you've joined us. Okay, great. Yeah, I want to thank you, Henrik and, and Jens and, and Andreas, for such a productive uh, webinar and exchange. Clearly, the progress is uh, continuing to mount, and, and you guys have been you know, significant leaders in this field. We Quanterics remain very committed to neurology. Yeah, as most of you know, we won the General Electric NFL Head Health Ch Challenge twice, and just this week I did speak with the top management of the NFL, and they are very interested to continue our collaboration, which I found very encouraging. Uh, we also continue to work with a wide range of thought leaders, um, as well as pharmaceutical partners um, who are developing the next generation of neural health and protective treatments. We now have placed over 100 instruments around the world and conducted 325 studies in our accelerator services lab. That uh, accelerator has been growing um, at greater than 100% a quarter. It's just a very rapid growth. A third of our instruments are now in neurology. The balance are in oncology, cardiology, inflammation, immunology, and infectious disease. We were very fortunate to raise $50 million back a few months ago to further develop Quanterix into Samoa technology and have announced several strategic partnerships, which we think are critical even based on these discussions today for antibody supply and neuroassays. And that includes GFAP and UCHL1 from Banyan and seven new ultra-sensitive neuromarkers from ImmunoArray. Uh, Tau, obviously, from ADX, and most recently, we're excited to announce that we just signed a term sheet with Uman Diagnostics for the ultra-sensitive assay to detect NFL, which directly in blood, which is clearly um, you know, the work that Henrik and uh, Jen has discussed today. So we're going to continue progressing our investments on every front. We can't tell you how inspired we are by the work that you're all doing in neurology and the importance of it. We also have formed a summit called PPH, uh, pphsummit.com. It's um, Powering Precision Health. We ran our inaugural session last week, and we'll be running them around the world over the next several years. So if you go on that website, pphsummit.com, you'll be able to learn more about the science-driven publications and making sure we, we lead with the science around all of these different uh, therapeutic areas. So once again, Andreas, Jens, and Henrik, thank you so much for a very productive session today. We, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you to Elizabeth thank you. as well and see you Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you to all.